And that's where the nitinol application really provided a lot of benefit for um, cardiovascular stents in that you now have an actuator, particularly with the super elastic effect, where we can take that stent and because it can undergo, the material can undergo really high strains under deformation, I can take a large diameter stent compress it down to a very small diameter without actually plastically deforming the material mm -hmm. and then pull a sheath over that stent um, to hold it onto the catheter. And then once we advance it into the body to the location where we want to deploy it, pull that sheath back and the, the device will automatically expand out to its um, original shape. Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World. We're the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And without further ado, let's get right into it. Our sponsor today is Johnson Matthey, a global leader in sustainable technology. Johnson Matthey's vision is for a world that's cleaner and healthier today and for future generations. Johnson Matthey's scientists use their deep understanding of materials, surface science, chemistry, and chemical engineering to design catalysts, advanced materials, and processes, tackling the world's biggest challenges, such as reaching net zero, enabling cleaner air, improving health, and using our planet's natural resources more efficiently. For over 20 years, they have been in the manufacturing and shape setting of nitinol tubes, sheets, and components for the medical device industry, so Johnson Matthey is an ideal sponsor for today's podcast. Johnson Matthew, inspiring science, enhancing life. Hello everyone. Our guest today is Dr. Gerald Redman, a senior engineering program manager and technical fellow at Medtronic Spine and Biologics. Before transitioning to the spine division, he worked in Medtronic's cardiovascular group where he used nitinol extensively for stent-based heart valves. With over 20 years of experience working in the medical device industry, we are really happy to welcome Gerald onto the show. Thank you so much for joining us, Gerald. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, happy to be here with you guys. Of course, of course. So let's start with the basics. What is nitinol and what properties does this fascinating material have that make it particularly unique and useful? Yes, well, nitinol is a, it's an alloy. Um, it's actually an alloy of nickel and titanium. Um, the material um, has a trademark name that's kind of based on where it was initially researched. Um, so the Nai Tai of the nitinol is you know, tied to the nickel titanium, um, but the, the tail end of that, the, the, the nitinol of the null um, component is the Naval Ordnance Laboratory um, mm -hmm. is where this material was initially researched. Um, so it's a uh, alloy that's about 50-50 atomic percent nickel and titanium. Um, um, but most importantly, it has unique properties of what is called shape memory. Um, and you've probably seen this material in a number of applications. Uh, probably the, the one that I always remember is in an eyeglass store. Uh, where you know they'll show you this these crazy glass frames that you can wrap around your finger, and then you release them and they spring back to their original shape. Uh, mm -hmm. That's an example of nitinol um, in terms of this application, um, this ideal of shape memory, um, and that opens the door for a lot of possible applications of the material. Cool. cool. And so there's also a super elasticity component to it, right? How is that related to shape memory with this nitinol material? Yeah, so you know the interesting part of it is what you'll typically hear people refer to this material as, you'll hear them call it a shape memory alloy. Uh, and shape memory can define both the super elastic state and what we typically refer to as the shape memory state. Got it. Um, but in reality, it's two different um, mechanical responses that you're seeing. So shape memory is usually tied to the temperature uh, induce transformation in the material where under um, application of heat, you can get the material to recover its shape. So if you deform it, apply heat to it, it'll re recover its shape. And that's usually what people refer to when they say shape memory alloys. Uh, but super elasticity is also an ideal of re remembering the original shape. Uh, but this is what's called the stress induced transformation. So instead of applying heat, 
under the application of load, you can deform the material. And once you release that load, uh, the material will spring back to its original shape. Um, and that terminology is usually either referred to just purely as super elasticity or um, the elastic shape memory effect. We talked to you earlier, I kind of mentioned it before, but one of the major applications were in cardiovascular stent procedures. Uh, can you kind of talk to us about how that shape memory really helps nitinol in this application and also what the procedure looked like before we could use such a cool material? Yeah, so cardiovascular stents um, you know, have a long history of clinical use, you know, probably dating back to the late 70s or early 1980s, where um, these are little mesh devices, usually either wires or um, laser cut tubes that have a um, kind of a um, lattice pattern to them. Um, they really give you that application that you can compress them down to pretty small diameters. Uh, and then you can redeploy them in larger diameters in the body. And they're mainly used to open up vessels in the body uh, for you know, cases where you have clogged vessels or in cases where you have a collapsed vessel or even more recently in the, the transcatheter heart valve space where you're actually uh, replacing a, a patient's heart valve inside the heart. Um, you use it to kind of prop open that space. And so the early technology of these devices focused mainly in the area of balloon expandable stents using traditional metals like uh, stainless steels and uh, cobalt alloys, uh, where you'd have a material that's very ductile that allows you to compress it down on top of a balloon that's attached to a catheter, which is essentially just a long tube. Uh, and then that can be advanced you know, through an incision in the leg or you know, maybe an incision near the neck and you can advance that into the location in the body where you want to deploy the stent. And then um, the balloon can be expanded under pressure to essentially take that compressed stent and expand it up to a larger diameter um, and leave it in place within the body. Um, and one of the challenges with you know, the balloons is, you know, there, you know, potentially you have balloon ruptures that can happen. Um, all traditional metals will um, have the potential for recoil. And so once you expand it up and you release the balloon, the material is going to recoil um, somewhat. And so you have to over expand it to get it into that state. Um, and yeah, that potential that might it migrates. So if it, you know, if you don't expand it enough and it recoils and it doesn't have good uh, apposition to the vessel walls, it could potentially migrate. And that's where the nitinol application really provided a lot of benefit for um, cardiovascular stents in that you now have an actuator, particularly with the super elastic effect, where we can take that stent and because it can undergo, the material can undergo really high strains under deformation, I can take a large diameter stent, compress it down to a very small diameter without actually plastically deforming the material, and then pull a sheath over that stent um, to hold it onto the catheter. And then once we advance it into the body to the location where we want to deploy it, pull that sheath back and the, the device will automatically expand out to its um, original shape. I and mean, if I uh, oversize the device just a little bit relative to the anatomy, the device is going to expand to that original shape and also put an outward force against the vessel to help keep it in place. Very wow. interesting. Yeah, it sounds like technology has really progressed since that first balloon method. I guess just kind of talking about all those negative effects, was that process dangerous beforehand and is nitinol safer? It is. And, you know, so the, the approach of um, the balloon expandables, you, you know, you get into the potential risk associated with the balloon itself and making sure that um, you don't have uh, balloon ruptures. Um, another, you know, scenario with particularly transcatheter heart valve replacement is in the scenario where you, you're usually replacing the aortic valve of the heart. And uh, for the aortic valve, that's your main exit pathway for blood flow out of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, most of the work in the transcatheter valve space has been around uh, replacing uh, that specific valve. And in the case of a balloon expandable, you'd have to occlude the entire uh, valve orifice in order to get that device expanded. And that creates the risk of a uh, cardiac arrhythmia for the patient. And so what um, the clinicians ended up having to do to, in order to use balloon expandable technology for uh, transcatheter aortic valves is they would rapid pace the patient. And so they essentially put the patient into fibrillation or an arrhythmia 
um, so that they reduce the risk that they're actually going to cause an arrhythmia as they expand the device. Uh, whereas with Night Dog, you eliminate the need for that balloon and you can deploy the device with the heart still beating uh, into that space and, and not have that, that, that risk of the procedure. Wow. So they induced an arrhythmia altogether <laughs> with, the, with the stainless steel in order to save the patient in the end. That's right. That's right. You know, I think <laughs> if, you, if you're going to have an arrhythmia, it's best to have it when you're, you know, there with the clinician <laughs> that's when they treat you. Uh, but that's exactly what they would do. They literally would induce an arrhythmia. And I think that's still the, the, the method that's used for those types of devices um, is to essentially put the patient into essentially cardiac arrest um, uh, temporarily in order to get the device place. Wow. Thanks for asking that question for me. I, I thought I may have misheard him there. <laughs> that sounds crazy. I don't know why you would ever want that, but uh, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad Nightingale is solving that need now. Yeah, that's so interesting. Actually, David and I did a capstone project related to creating a medical device with, um, to treat cardiac arrest patients, sudden cardiac arrest patients, um, with, a, you know, improving the CPR protocol. So um, all of this is particularly interesting to us and it's cool to see Night Null's applications in this space as well. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so diving into that a little bit, what mechanisms give Night Null its shape, memory and super elasticity properties? Like, can you discuss the phase transformation from austenite to martensite and back at these critical temperatures that you mentioned or the critical pre uh, applied loads? Yeah, so really the, the mechanism that, you know, gives the, the material this really interesting mechanical behavior uh, is a diffusionless uh, phase transformation, uh, and it's referred to as a martensitic transformation. Uh, and so really it's just a change in the crystallographic orientation of the, the lattice of the material. Uh, and it's really a change in the crystal structure from austenite, which is um, a simple cubic structure in, in nitinol, to a, um, a monoclinic um, structure, which is kind of a distorted um, you know, cubic crystal, or more like a, a kind of a rectangular prismatic um, shape. And this process of which the material you know, changes between these two crystal structures is an order um, lattice reorientation which allows it to you know, accommodate different um, conditions like deformation um, such that when, you, when we actually do the shape memory effect and we apply a, a temperature to um, change between austenite and martensite, um, you go from what is initially a martensitic state in the material. And so the material is in a, you know, has a martensite lattice and you go through a process of um, twinning um, the lattice you know, when you apply the, the temperature. And so you convert between the martensite to the austenite stage. And then you can you know, essentially deform the material. Uh, and then that deformation of the material in that state um, essentially is a, a detwinning process. Um, so you know, essentially I take a, a martensite material I uh, deform it um, and well, I should, maybe to go back, you'll start off with a, you know, a twin martensite material. I deform it and that gets me to uh, deform martensite and then I apply heat and it goes back to austenite. Um, and then for the, the super elastic effect, you're really just going between you know, an austenitic state, which is where it starts off at. And then you uh, apply a deformation to it and at a certain stress level, you'll induce the, the transformation in the material. Um, you convert the lattice to deform martensite. And then as you unload it, uh, the material goes back through that uh, process of um, detwinning and converts back to austenite. So the best way to think of it is austenite is the high temperature phase of the material. That's the state that the material is super elastic. And martensite is the low temperature phase of the material. And that's the state where the material um, operates as um, the shape memory effect. And so then to go to recover the shape when you're in the um, shape memory effect, you're applying heat to convert it back to the, the base lattice structure of the material, which is austenite, which is the equilibrium phase of the material. And that's what recovers the shape. And for the super elastic effect, you're applying stress which actually induces uh, martensite in the material. And you're 
essentially operating within what are known as the transformation temperatures for these two different uh, crystal structures to behave in a material. And so in the case of the super elastic effect, we process the material such that um, it's energetically favorable to stress induce martensite into the material. And then when we release that load, uh, we revert back to austenite. Got it, got it. So can we unpack that a little bit? You mentioned twinning, and that's a topic that's covered quite frequently in our material science courses. Can you explain what exactly twinning means in this context? Yeah, so it's really just where the, the lattice structure kind of mirrors itself along a plane. And so if you think about, you know, basics back to, you know, different crystal structures and you define a regular repeating pattern um, within the, the lattice, depending on what type of crystal structure you're looking at. A uh, twin plane essentially is where you have a, a replication of one stacking sequence across a plane to another stacking sequence. So it's, it's almost like a mirroring of the lattice. And if you were to look at it on metallographic you know, images, you typically see what appears to be kind of like a, a pattern of, of lines or um, you know, kind of defects that show up in the structure. Um, and they look pretty regular uh, within the material. So it kind of seems, just to recap, it seems like the shape memory is that whole temperature thing with the martensite to austenite. And then the super elasticity is kind of working within the stress boundaries. So I guess now that you've given us a really good background into the kind of the MSC perspective of how nitinol works, and you told us that great story about the stent, about how it completely changed how the procedure is done. I guess from a MSC perspective, could you tell us more about how like we as MSCs provided innovation within nitinol? Like I'm sure nitinol wasn't originally used for stents. So what was the story of getting there almost? Yeah, so you know, the, if you look at the history of this material, it was I think some of the early stages of you know development of shape memory alloys you know dates back even to the um, you know early to mid 1900s, uh, and I think nitinol itself was you know discovered you know, kind of in the mid 1900s. Um, but the challenge was at that time it was very difficult to process the material. And there wasn't a well-defined application for it. So after its initial development, um, you know, I think around the early 1970s is where they probably had a pretty good um, definition for um, how to process the material and um, some initial use cases for how it could be used. Uh, the material actually didn't get significant use from an application standpoint to sometime in the 80s, just because they're the, the real challenge was that designers really hadn't been exposed to the material to determine what were the applications that were going to be useful uh, for actually um, applying this material. And, you know, it really goes back to this idea that, you know, all of this is, you know, pretty heavy material science and, you know, the chemistry, you know, leads to structure and structure to performance. And, you know, with the ideal of night and all, the, the challenge with this material is, you know, in processing it, is that very slight changes in the nickel to titanium ratio um, in less than 1% uh, weight percent of the material um, can result in drastic shifts of the transformation temperatures for converting between austenite and martensite. And so then it becomes very difficult to measure those chemical changes accurately. Um, and so coming up with processing methods for how you actually control the material um, is a challenge. And that's something that had to be worked through over the years to come up with methods to actually measure what you're getting uh, when you produce the alloy. And, you know, typically the way that that's done now is through the use of um, bend and free recovery tests or through uh, differential scanning calorimetry, where you can actually measure um, the phase transformation, either through measuring the recovery of the material mm -hmm. under some applied load or you know, measuring the peaks of the, the transformation um, through the, the heat evolution from the differential scanning calor calorimetry. Um, but it goes back to kind of thinking of it from a materials science perspective or materials engineer perspective. I think there's a, a lesson to be learned in that you know, processing of light and all that um, you know, having a new alloy in a material that, you know, you think really has, you know, some really good properties and beneficial effects, it really can't 
make that next leap or next step to application unless you can define um, you know people who are working in that space mm-hmm. and designers who are in need of you know materials that have certain functions and applications you really need to marry the material science aspect of it with the you know device application and uh, the design application of the device in order to really find those uh, use cases where it's going to be beneficial yeah, that's great. Yeah, I would just like to touch on that. You, so you've had a very wide uh, range in history of where you worked on and like what sectors. Uh, and I guess just through my experience in internships and other things, uh, and one of the things that drew me to MSE was that we take things that are in theory or from lab, and we actually apply them to things that people can use. And that's why I think is empowering about MSE. So I would love to hear just like what you think that like MSE's greatest strength or uh, what we can build upon in the future for bringing these new materials into the consumer realm. Yeah, so you know, I think the the biggest challenge of, I see, at least in the medical device space, is that you know designers you know have some base understanding of you know the material properties and materials that they're working with, and you know, and, and even within the medical device space, you know, things are even more constrained just because they're the materials that are known to be biocompatible are pretty well defined. Mm -hmm. And so once you go outside of that window, you raise biocompatibility questions that have to be answered um, beyond just the functional um, questions that have to be answered. But I think the designers tend to have a basic level of understanding, but they don't have a deep knowledge about some of the um, conditions of which the material either performs well or doesn't perform well or particular information about the processing of the material and even how to understand how uh, properties of the material are not you know, deterministic, but they're more probabilistic and stochastic such that you know, from lot to lot, you're gonna get variation that could affect your design. And I think that's really where the, the MSC background comes in is really having that expertise to know, uh, even when we're working with you know, known materials, um, you have to account for variance in properties. Um, you have to you know, look at how are we actually processing the material through uh, the different manufacturing steps and how that might affect the properties of the material. And then if you go outside of you know, the traditional materials that you typically use and start looking at new material applications, uh, particularly in medical, um, the biocompatibility aspect of this uh, becomes a, a key point that you have to really nail down early on. Uh, before you even get into some of the functional um, aspects of the material. Got it. So with the stent applications, for example, obviously nitinol has to, you know, move through those tortuitous paths within the body. And so biocompa- biocompatibility is a key characteristic for nitinol there. How exactly does that work? Is it s- similar to titanium in general, where it creates a titanium oxide layer that is inert? and therefore makes it biocompatible, or is it a, another process altogether? You're exactly right. The titanium oxide layer is the key um, metric or the key condition that you have to have for nitinol. Uh, the material, um, you know, in terms of its biocompatibility, uh, corrosion resistance is the, the primary um, you know, factor that has to be you know, accounted for. Um, because the material has a high amount of nickel in it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, nickel uh, can have adverse effects in the human body. Um, there are also a, about you know, 10 to 15% of the population has um, nickel allergies. Wow. Uh, and so release of free nickel in the body is not ideal. And the material um, also does not have good corrosion resistance unless you have a very uniform titanium oxide layer mm-hmm. on, the, on the surface. Uh, and so that's really where the, the main focus for nitinol comes in from a biocompatibility perspective is making sure that you have um, a process to create a, uh, a good titanium oxide layer. And that's typically done through a, a well-qualified uh, uh, electropolishing process um, to achieve a, a certain type of titanium oxide layer on the surface. And there are a couple of different um, oxides that you can um, produce depending on how you process the material. And that's been pretty well worked through for the medical device space that, you know, if you're using something that's an implantable uh, version of the material, um, you want to target 
a specific uh, titanium oxide condition, a specific electro polishing condition, uh, versus if it's more of a short term use application like a, an instrument, um, then you can um, you know maybe not target as um, you know astringent of a, an oxide layer because you you have less of a concern of the the biocompatibility issue. One quick question about the corrosion. It's I'm actually taking a corrosion class now, and I assume when a lot of our listeners hear corrosion, they think like rust in water, like the iron mm -hmm. corrodes to rust. So exactly what in the human body is corroding uh, the nitinol that could adversely affect us? Yeah, so, you know, corrosion in and of itself is it's an electrochemical process and it's, you know, oxidation reduction processes. And so it's really the scenario where if, if I have uh, ions uh, on the surface of the material, um, they can interact with oxygen in the environment. And essentially what's happening is you're stripping away metal uh, from the material. And, you know, what you, like you mentioned, rust, um, that really is the byproduct of these ions binding with oxygen to form a, a byproduct of an oxide. Uh, and so that's the, the biggest way to think of it is, you know, I have to create an inner layer on that surface. Um, so like we were talking about with titanium oxide, titanium is a very reactive element. Um, so it binds with oxygen uh, readily. And so once I bind up that titanium in oxygen, it forms a very inert layer such that I don't have that free titanium um, on the surface that could uh, be used to, to strip away the material. In the case of nitinol, it's the nickel that you know, is going to be the, the question mark. So if I have free nickel on the surface, um, that creates the potential for uh, corrosion in the material. Interesting. So is nickel not corrosion resistant? Uh, it's really just the idea of not um, you know, providing that you know, opportunity for free nickel to be on the surface. So you know, as long as we can bind up the you know, elements into oxides, Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you get the benefit. And that's, you know, you know, it applies across for most metals as well. You know, most metals that are reactive in an electrochemical um, condition, mm -hmm. um, they get their corrosion resistance from the formation of oxide layers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really just the idea of having a uniform oxide layer, similar to what happens with stainless steels and, and other you know, materials, titanium, uh, cobalt alloys, is that you're essentially creating a inert oxide layer on the surface and eliminating the potential for free um, ions to be on the surface. And you know it, it's problematic not only from a kind of gross perspective where you know you have potentials for you know general corrosion, um, but you know having a uniform surface becomes important so that you know if I have localized you know, you know notches or pits and crevices on the surface, I can still, even if I have a passivated material where I have an inert layer, I can still have some free nickel that shows up um, at those you know, localized spots that creates uh, pitting corrosion. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not only just creating that inert layer of a, a titanium oxide, but also you know, making sure that you have a very uniform layer. Yeah, I remember in our corrosion class, there was always that trade-off that, you know, those materials that are more inherently corrosion resistant through that passive oxide layer tend to also be more expensive. So that definitely plays a role in, you know, the aircraft space or even the biomedical space, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. And then you got, you know, you can have your uh, completely inert materials, you know, like your noble um, metals and, you know, they don't, you don't have the issue of corrosion with those metals, but as you mentioned, <laughs> they're super expensive. And unfortunately, in most cases, their mechanical properties are not as suited for some of the applications that we're trying to use them for. And I guess on the topic of cost, just for my edification, uh, what does like a nitinol stent or like a gram of nitinol cost? No, off the top of my head, I don't have the number for a gram um, of nitinol or, you know, even you know, kilograms or pounds, but um, comparatively to um, some of the other materials that we typically use for, you know, these applications like stainless steels, um, you know, it can be in a range of two to three times the cost. Oh, wow. okay. uh, and it's all tied to how the material is processed. Uh, the processing of nitinol is more complicated than it is for you know, processing your traditional uh, alloys. Um, and, and you look across the different forms of nitinol, um, you know, wire-based forms tend to be probably the lower costs. Uh, 
are the lowest cost versions. Uh, whereas um, tubing applications, which is where cardiovascular stents are typically produced from, tend to be the higher cost applications uh, just because of the, the challenges in uh, you know, drawing um, long tubes and small diameter tubes um, and keeping the, the walls um, consistent in terms of wall thickness. Um, and the material is you know, difficult to cold work. And in all of the cases where you actually um, create the uh, mechanical response, super elasticity or shape memory, um, you need to have some cold work in the material. Uh, and so that's one of the, the challenges with it, not only with the, the melt chemistry and you know, maintaining um, you know, knowledge of the slight you know, changes in, in nickel to titanium ratio that controls the transformation temperatures, but also, and then how do you, you know, work the material to get a certain amount of cold work into it um, such that you can then, you know, shift the transformation temperatures to your specific uh, application that you're going to use it for. And, you know, one other thing I'll throw in there too is, you know, in a lot of cases for how nitinol gets used, you know, if I get it in a wire form or a sheet form or tubing form, um, I need to ultimately create a device from it. Um, some cases I might just be able to machine the shape of that device and that machine shape is the condition that I want it. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you're actually trying to create a device that's in a, a different, you know, geometry and form. Um, like a good example is with stents where, you know, you start off with the idea that, that I want to stent this a, a certain diameter uh, and I want it to be that diameter when it's in the body. But then when I actually, you know, compress it down to get it onto a catheter to get it into the body, it needs to be much smaller. And so what's typically done for stents is they're laser cut from small diameter tubes is already at that, you know, small size that you initially want um, the thing to be crimped down to, uh, but then they have to undergo a shape setting process to actually get them to the final uh, fully expanded state and lock in that super elastic condition. And that shape setting process is essentially a heat treatment process where you progressively expand the diameter of that stent um, using mandrels um, and heat treating the material up in a range of about 500 degrees Celsius. Uh, for you know so many minutes, depending on what the uh, mandrel size is and uh, you know what your uh, temperature um, conditions are, but the ideal is I'm going to process the material to get it into a final you know shape, uh, and that adds additional costs uh, to the material as well. Uh, and so I think it's all of those different factors you have to weigh when you're considering you know the the nitinol application is not only the processing by the suppliers that produce the raw forms, but also processing that you would have to do um, to get the device into its, its actual use application. Yeah, I looked up Nitinol's cost on Amazon and it's only $14.95, but um, as you mentioned, <laughs> uh, that's only the Nitinol wire, not the tube. And obviously there's not the shape setting processes or anything else. So I'm sure it's a lot more expensive than that in, in the medical device field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The wire applications actually have uh, gotten to a pretty cost effective uh, application. Um, yeah, so you probably can find some pretty cheap wire and <laughs> use that. <laughs> But yeah, for, I think for stents in particular and tubing applications, and it can be quite expensive. Yeah, maybe it can be used for like teacher demonstrations, but not necessarily for, for stents. So that makes <laughs> That's sense. <right. laughs> cool, cool. So let's move outside of the cardiovascular space and let's talk about bone staples for a moment. So you mentioned that nitinol can be used for bone staples for fusion procedures after bone fractures. And so these shape memory properties seem to provide a distinct advantage over, you know, previous iterations of these staples when stainless steel was used. Can you talk us through exactly how nitinol's shape memory properties prove very useful in this application? Yeah, so, you know, that's another, you know, really cool application of nitinol in the medical device space. Um, you know, if you look across where it's been used in medical devices, you know, throughout, it's been used in a lot of different applications. Um, a lot of non-implant applications with instruments, but also with implant applications and stents and um, anastomosis devices and, you know, devices that are used to cut off or 
occlude, um, you know, foramen or, or orifices that have been formed from defects in the, in the patient. But the bone staple application is, is um, actually one of the earlier applications of nitinol, probably some of its earliest uses in medical were uh, tied to orthopedic applications. And the ideal of a bone staple is, you know, if you have a traumatic event where you fractured bone, um, you have these, you know, two surfaces of fractured bone that need to be rejoined together in order for you to get uh, healing and uh, fusion of that bone. And, you know, the approach of the nitinol bone staple is either using the shape memory effect or even the super elastic effect. Uh, I can go in, you know, particularly with the shape memory material, uh, I can, you know, create a material that's martensitic uh, at the operating temperature. And now it's very ductile and malleable. Uh, so I can deform it into a shape that will allow me to get it inserted across the two, you know, bone materials and, and uh, across that fracture joint. Uh, and then if I use either body temperature as my heating element or apply heat to it, um, I can get it to convert back to its original shape. And so that original shape ideally is going to be a shape where the staple is compressed. And so that application of heat will help pull those bone surfaces together um, and join those materials. Um, super elasticity could also be used where if you take a device that's already been formed into a super elastic shape where it's in a compressed state, then I could put it into a delivery system similar to like we do with stents that holds it in an open shape, get it across uh, the two fractured pieces of bone and then remove the delivery system and allow it to collapse back in. That, that sounds kind of painful to have done, but it sounds pretty useful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really just taking advantage of that idea of, you know, the material, um, these mechanical responses give you an actuator. Uh, and you can use that actuator either from, you know, application of temperature in which you, know, you think about the application of temperature it allows me to form something, hold that form shape, and then apply the temperature to go to the original shape. Or for application of stress means that I apply the stress to hold the shape. And then when I release the stress, it recovers the shape. And I, I guess just for a clarifying question is I've only like broken a finger. So I don't, I don't think I've ever needed a bone staple before, but would this be used in conjunction with like a cast or what exactly uh, like, like warrants a bone staple? It could, yes. So it could be used in conjunction with a cast. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it could be used with you know fusion, you know, biologics to help you know heal the bone. Um, but yeah, it's either going to be cast or splint or something to help keep those um, you know you know surfaces together as well. I, uh, other applications we talked about before is also something called self-closing sutures, which I believe is called coalescent clips. Could you tell us more about this application in general and Nainal's role in that application? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting you know, use case as well. Um, so when you think about you know, sutures, uh, these are typically used in cases where you have um, a wound or an incision where you have you know, soft tissue surfaces that have been you know, cut or severed and you need to join them back together. Um, in surgical procedures where surgeons actually are um, you know, performing surgery, they have to go, go in and cut through soft tissue or vessels in some, in some cases. When they cut through vessels um, and they try to rejoin that vessel, that you know, severed you know, vessel is called, a, um, a, 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 the joining of that severed vessel is called an anastomosis. Uh, and what they typically would do is using you know, typical sutures, which are you know, polyester, you know, either braided or monofilament materials with a needle on them, you know, they would pass the needle through the tissue and they have a number of different, you know, methods for how they actually pass that as either an interrupted suture or a continuous suture. And then they tie off um, those sutures to, to seal the, the vessel or seal the tissue. Um, Coalescent Clip um, was a product that used nitinol to do like a self-collapsing or self-tying suture. So the whole idea here is there was a needle that was attached to a nitinol wire and then that wire was coiled. Um, and then the coil of that wire was placed within a, a little sheath. And so you think of a needle, a wire that has a coil on it, and then it was formed and kind of like a U shape. So the natural state of the material or the, the original shape, so, so to speak, is where that coil wants to collapse on itself. So go from a U to a kind of like a, an O shape. Uh, and, but what 
they would do is put the sheath around it. So now it holds it into that U shape. And so then the surgeon could take the needle, pass it through the tissue to join the, the two edges and then pull away that sheath. And then the coil would collapse on itself without the surgeon having to tie it off himself. Um, so it was a really neat application. There was a couple of different versions of that um, clip um, that were just for interrupted sutures or some that could deploy multiple coils at once to join uh, vessels together. So tying it back to MSC, in what instances in that specific application, is it in the Martin site, Martin Siddick phase versus the Austinite phase? Yeah, so this is all using the super elastic effect. So kind of back to that thing we were talking about earlier is, you know, the um, austenite is the phase that you're in or the super elastic that that's the high temperature uh, phase. And so in this case, you've set your transformation temperatures such that in my operating environment, um, I'm above the austenite um, finishing temperature. Mm -hmm. So the material is fully austenitic. And so that's where the stress-induced transformation is energetically favorable. And so that allows me to um, essentially remove that load by removing a sheath. And now the material collapses back on itself and takes on its original shape. Uh, and so the, that's really taking advantage of a super elastic effect. Whereas if it was the shape memory, it would be Martin site at your operating temperature. Now in the Martin Cynic state is completely deformable. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I apply any load to it, it's gonna hold that shape, but then I have to apply heat to actually go from Martin site to Austinite, which allows for recovery of the shape. Got it. So at no point is it in that Martin Cynic phase where it's like ductile and malleable for that shape memory. It's just purely the super elastic effect for these. Well, that's a really good point. So, you know, in that process of, you know, converting between, you know, Austinite to Martin site. So in the, you know, super elastic effect and the stress induced transformation, the transformation is actually happening on the stress. So you're actually converting a you know, volume of the material between uh, austenite to martensite. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'd be good if we had a diagram that we could show <laughs> here. But, you know, if you were to look at the stress strain curve, um, you have what's known as a, a plateau stress. And so this is essentially the stress for activation of the transformation. And once you hit that plateau stress, um, you have a conversion of austenite to martensite. And as you increase in the strain, you're increasing the volume fraction of martensite in the material. Uh, but at the point that you release the, the load, the martensite is not stable in the material. And so you will convert that to uh, austenite. And there's a hysteresis loop in that stress strain curve. And so just think of the stress induced transformation is that you're triggering the generation of the Martin site phase under applied load, uh, but it's not stable uh, without the load applied. And so it will revert back to austenite once you release the load. So let's talk about the challenges a little bit. I know we already discussed, you know, humans sensitivity to nickel. 10 to 15% of humans, that is, as well as the processing difficulty and the associated high costs. In your opinion, what are the next steps to address those challenges from the material science perspective? Yeah, so you know, one of the things in the, the space of medical devices that has been you know, pursued in, in, on many fronts is, you know, is there another shape memory alloy um, that doesn't have nickel? Um, in it. Um, and so there are a number of different other um, you know, metals and metal alloys that, um, you know, have shape memory effects. Um, unfortunately, nitinol is the, the only one that's proven out to have a, a more stable shape memory effect, as well as a really a high strain accommodation that you can get with the super elastic, the super elastic effect where you can accommodate up to about six to 8% of recoverable strain uh, before the material starts to actually plastically deform. Um, and so I think that's probably been the biggest focus um, with nitinol is just knowing that the material is gonna be very sensitive to surface processing and that you have to ensure that you have, you know, inner titanium oxide layer in the material to prevent it from corroding and um, cause the issues with nickel in the human body. I think the biggest focus has been around, you know, can we develop, you know, shape memory alloys that give us, you know, similar performance to nitinol without nickel.
um, being included in them. Um, the cost piece of it, um, I think the suppliers of Night and All have done a quite a bit of work on you know, how do you reduce the cost of the material. Um, but there's still just in, inherent challenges to this, just based on the fact that the, the chemistry um, is difficult to control and you know, know with exact confidence. And then just the ability to work with the material um, for forging um, processes can, can be quite a bit difficult because the you know, material is, you know, it recovers its shape uh, really well. So if you're trying to cold work the material, you have to run it through a number of different um, you know, processes of, of heat treatment to uh, reduce the overall stress in the material as you work with it, um, mm -hmm. because it can become um, you know, quite a bit brittle um, you know, through a number of different co-working processes. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, work to do almost, but um, <laughs> I have confidence that we can solve these issues. But I guess just if we were to solve these processing issues, or if we were to find another shape memory alloy that is more easily accessible, uh, to use in other applications like what would these other applications look like do you think that you've thought about using shape memory alloys but cost or processing or other ways have uh, decided not to and you had to go another way yeah you know i always go back to you know the, the ideal to the the designer and saying okay you know what is it ultimately from a function standpoint are you trying to achieve and, you know, one of the things I say is, you know, if, if you're debating whether or not uh, you can use type might and all of your application, or you could use a traditional metal for your application and still get the same function, then you probably shouldn't be using might and all. Um, <laughs> it's just this material that is very difficult, not only the processing piece that we've discussed, but I think just understanding the mechanical response of the material, uh, because, you know, as we mentioned, if we had a, a you know, diagram we could show here, just the, the stress strain response of the material is very unique to uh, traditional metals and something that people aren't typically familiar with in terms of having plateau stresses and, um, you know, two different, you know, um, you know, linear elastic regions with the austenite, you know, linear elastic curve. And then if you go beyond 8% strain in the super elastic effects, you get the Martin site. Um, you know, linear elastic response. Uh, and then, you know, the ideal of, you know, to controlling where these plateau stresses happen, you know, you have an upper and lower plateau stress and uh, those stresses shift based on the transformation temperature. So even if I specify that, you know, I'm going to be super elastic, I need to specify at what temperature ranges I'm are controlling the super elasticity and that those temperature ranges um, will actually result in slight shifts in the, um, the hysteresis and the, in those plateau stresses. Uh, and then, you know, even going beyond that with, you know, devices that actually undergo cyclic loading, um, the cyclic response of the material, um, you know, is something that is not well understood, you know, at the, the base level in that, you know, once I had load up onto the the upper plateau stress and I come back to the lower plateau stress, I'm cycling now within the hysteresis. Mm -hmm. um, and that hysteresis loop is not completely stable. So it shifts over time. Um, and so then you have to understand that. So it's, it's going back to the idea of there are a lot of considerations for how you use this material. Um, and you know, if, if you could use a traditional metal and you can still get the same response or same performance, um, I think it, it's a definitely a better route to go. But if there, if there are unique properties that you're trying to achieve uh, that you cannot achieve uh, with a traditional metal, you know, I think stents are a perfect example of that, where if I want to go from a really large diameter stent down to a small diameter so that I can get it into a blood vessel, um, the amount of strain that a geometric shape has to undergo to do that is tremendous. Uh, and you really can't do that with a, a traditional metal unless you use something like a, a malleable material and you balloon expand the material uh, like we were talking about earlier. Have there been any other applications in your experience where it has been like, oh, night and all would be a great fit for this, but the, the costs would be too high or the processing challenges would be too high? Um, you know, I think... Some of the instrument applications, you know, we've looked at it for um, applications for, you know, instruments that could be used um, in the OR, either uh, shape memory conditions where, you know, 
the instrument could be deformed into a shape to insert it into the body or, um, you know, some other condition where you're mounting um, something onto um, a, a post that you can deform into different orientations. And then you could use um, the sterilization process to recover the shape. Um, and then you'll go through that kind of rework or reuse loop. Uh, I think those are really interesting applications, but I think in those scenarios, you do run into probably some cost questions uh, just because, you know, the volume of, you know, instruments that you're going to produce, you know, probably doesn't warrant the complexity of the, um, the, the material or at least the application here. Um, I think for implant applications, um, you know, I think as long as there is a true need and you have the, you know, capability and expertise to evaluate the function over the lifetime of the product, um, you know, and I think, you know, you think about cardiovascular applications, you're talking about cyclic loading. And so it's not just, you know, will it provide the, you know, monotonic single cycle response that I'm looking for where I compress it and re-expand it or I bend it and it, you know, re-expands. Uh, but I also need to know, is it going to be able to do that loading condition over many millions of cycles without failure? Um, as long as you can vet out that you have the you know, technical know-how within your organization or group to uh, understand how to you know, test it and model it um, so that you know to, what your operating conditions are. Uh, I don't think it's a cost issue as much in the implant side because the profit margins on the, the implant size are, are quite a bit higher. Um, and particularly any scenario where you have really high volumes and you know, high profit margins, I think the cost piece you know, it goes away. Uh, but I think it's, it's more that question of, you know, if you have low volume products or scenarios where um, the, the profit margins are, are not as you know, significant, then I think you definitely are going to run into a question of, you know, is the complexity associated with producing and controlling the material and understanding how to design it, does that outweigh the, the cost associated with the material? I appreciate you pointing out that nitinol is a really cool material, but there are the challenges, like you're not um, overdoing it, over-exaggerating its benefits, and you're keeping that in mind with the the processing challenges. So um, despite like all your experience with night and all. So I really do appreciate your input on all of that. Yeah, I think, you know, a, a lot of times that, you know, when people look at the, the use of this material, um, you know, it, it's kind of back to what we were talking about earlier is this, you know, you think about things a lot of times in a deterministic, you know, perspective is that, you know, I have a, you know, uh, a strength of X and, you know, uh, elongation of Y. And these are just kind of standard things that happen all the time. And every time I produce uh, a lot of material, I'm always going to get this. And that's just not realistic. And it gets even more complex with night and all just because, um, you know, a less than a percent change in chemistry can shift the transformation temperatures greatly. And so it really puts a lot of onus on the suppliers to ensure that, you know, they're controlling chemistry indirectly through measuring the transformation that you've specified the you know, conditions of which you can get acceptable material correctly. Uh, and, you know, you have well-defined specifications and, you know, you know, component drawings and so forth to define the conditions of how it's going to be used. Uh, but then back to the designers and the engineers that are actually, you know, designing and testing the devices, you know, they need to also understand the, you know, the variations that you're going to see and, you know, even just understanding that stress strain response to know that, you know, if, if I'm designing a device that always has to operate, you know, within a certain condition, then I'm going to have to, you know, go back to the drawing board and determine, can we actually control the material that we're getting consistently within that condition so that we're getting a consistent performing product? Um, and I think that's what probably gets a little bit lost on people um, sometimes when they're thinking about using this material is that it, you know, that, you know, cool uh, response that you're getting from a mechanical performance standpoint it's, it's not just a one shot <laughs> locked and loaded you know, right. response that you're always going to get. Right. There is variation in that and you got to account for that variation. Yeah. 
I think just expanding upon that, I know you talked about this a little bit before with like you, we as MSCs have the ability to explain to the design people exactly what's happening. I think I've heard a lot in industry and I think we may have talked about this before, but a lot of times engineers come up with cool stuff that sound cool and are really cool products, but in actuality, like your instrumentation is super cool, but it would never work. I guess just as your role as an MSC and like in your past experiences, like how do you become that voice of reason to kind of be like, I know the technology, I know the business side of it, like this is where we stand and it's just not gonna work. Yeah, it can be a difficult uh, conversation, I think, uh, you know, in a lot of cases. And I think it's, it's one of those things that, you know, as a younger engineer, um, you know, you develop, you know, your ability to, to be more vocal and to, to speak out and, um, you know, kind of have, you know, that ability to influence decisions over time. Um, but I think, you know, as a younger engineer, it can be quite challenging to step into a, a you know, team environment where you have a lot of senior level engineers that are um, involved in the decision making process and the, to really get that point across. Uh, I think the probably the key point is just making sure I think this is one of the you know, things that the medical device industry, I think, has done well and some of the regulatory agencies have done well is always focusing on doing risk assessments. Um, and so, you know, early on in the design process, going through that stage of, you know, thinking through what are all of the possible hazards that can occur from the use of this product. Uh, and that's where you know, the material aspects can get factored into that hazard assessment so that, you know, it's not just you throwing out warnings to the group and they have to trust that you're okay. <laughs> you know, this process kind of drives this idea that, you know, we do have to think through all of these possible you know, conditions that could go wrong, even if there are low probability events, and then go through that process of trying to put some quantitative you know, estimates around what's the likelihood of this happening. Um, you know, what's our ability to detect it? What's going to be the hazard to the, the patient? Uh, and then using that scoring method to you know, actually conclude, is this risk significant enough um, that we actually have to go out and take action? Or maybe it concludes that we can't use the, the product. I'll actually be joining the medical device industry very soon and risk management and risk assessment may be key aspects of my role. So I really yeah. love your insights into all of this, especially the how cyclic loading is evident in the cardiovascular space that really connected the dots between uh, my fatigue class and what I'll be doing in the future. So overall, I just wanted your opinion, your advice on this. How can early career professionals like myself, like David, with a materials engineering background, leverage their knowledge effectively to make an impact in this industry? Yeah, so, you know, I think it's, you know, really just that idea of learning as much as you can from, you know, people um, that, you know, you work with when you first start off. Um, you know, I think you guys have probably heard the expression of um, being green. I think that's, it's true. I think everybody goes through it when you first start off in, in the industry. Um, you're very green to, you know, how, you know, applied engineering and businesses operate. Uh, so I think just kind of being a sponge and, and learning from others is probably the, the, the first part that has really beneficial. And, you know, one of the things I always give is advice to um, new engineers is, you know, I went through this myself, is a lot of times you're going to run into people that will uh, start explaining something to you that you already feel you know. And so, you know, they'll start giving you this deep, you know, kind of elementary explanation of, you know, some process or some material or, you know, you know, some condition that you guys are, you know, evaluating and your initial reaction is to kind of just turn it off. So <laughs> I already know that, you know, there's no need for you to explain that to me. I, I'm, you know, I'd studied that in school or I've, I've had some experience with that. But what I always recommend is listen, even though you may know it. Because almost every scenario where I've run into that, where somebody, you know, it's explaining to something to me that I think is elementary and I already understand it. I always pick up on some nuance in terms of how they interpret and understand it that I didn't appreciate. Uh, so I think it's really just that a process of listening as much as possible. 
And then, you know, it's studying as well. I'd say that's probably another good part of it is once you start getting into your projects and getting into you know, your work responsibilities, try to you know, reduce that learning curve as quick as possible. So, you know, if it means, you know, pulling back up some of your textbooks and reading up on a few topics or, you know, if it's on the job training where you're being taught some of the things you didn't learn in school around, you know, like in the medical device space, some of the anatomy and physiology and pathology stuff, um, you know, take some time outside of work, you know, either you know, mornings, nights, weekends, and you know, try to catch up and burn down that learning curve as much as possible. And a lot of times, you know, once you kind of go through that, that process, you know, it's going to take, you know, six months to a year before you really feel comfortable with everything. You know, one of the things you guys will see quite a bit is uh, acronyms and terminology <laughs> is big in, in industry. And so you'll come into some of these meetings and these environments and uh, people are throwing around a lot of lingo and you know, acronyms and you have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> and it's, some of that type of stuff takes time to kind of get through the process. And, you know, it, it's, there's no way to short circuit and short, shortcut it. You just have to kind of go through the process of, you know, you know, the business and how things work. And, but once you kind of get to that point, which I, from my experience, is usually around that six months to one year timing, you'll, you'll get to a point where you, you start feeling comfortable and things just seem to start making sense. And I think that's when you kind of hit that inflection point on the learning curve. It's just, it's always nice to hear people's story about it's going to, it's going to work out, but here's some helpful tips. So thanks for the insight. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll always hear uh, somebody tell you, um, you know, that we've already tried that before. <laughs> uh, so, you know, don't get discouraged with that. You know, I think a lot of times as young engineers, you come in with the ideal that you're going to you know, change the world and you've got the, the new ideal that's going to revolutionize the business. Uh, and as I, I think always hold on to that because I think that motivation for your work is important. Mm -hmm. Even if, you know, you eventually realize that, you know, changing the world is maybe not possible at this company, <laughs> but, you know, hold on to that idea because I think it keeps you motivated in terms of your work and what you do. Um, and don't let the, the naysayers kind of get you uh, too dis discouraged in, in terms of telling you, yeah, we've already tried that. There's no need to to pursue that, you know, you know, keep looking, you know, maybe don't do it on the project specifically, but, you know, carve off a little bit of time to do a little bit of extra you know, digging and, and, you know, work on your own to, to keep pursuing some of those ideas that you have. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was very inspirational, very motivational. So thank you so much, Gerald, for coming onto the show. We really appreciate having you on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Gunnif, and thanks, David. Really enjoyed talking with you guys. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. If you enjoyed the show, consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. If you want to meet other passionate material scientists and engineers, join our Discord community using the link in the description. If you have any feedback for us, we would love to hear it. We want to grow this show with our community's input, so comment below with your thoughts on this episode and what topics you want to see us cover next. We'll see you very soon, and in the meantime, Go change the world.